Well, welcome everybody to our series, Game Changers in College and University Dining. My name is David Porter. I'm the CEO and president of Porter Ka Consulting. And today, uh, our, we're going to speak with Richard Fritz. And Richard is the director of residential dining at Northern Illinois University. Uh, we've known Richard uh, for probably the better part of the last 15 years had the opportunity to work with Richard on a number of very important projects. But today we're really going to talk about the work we did and then Richard uh, moved forward with at Northern Illinois University at uh, back in 2011. Welcome, Richard. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, thanks. Uh, good to be here and uh, I'm glad to be able to talk a little bit about our program at Northern. It's, uh, it's transitioned quite a bit over the last few years. and. Um, when I came into the program, it was uh, all a la carte in all the dining centers except for one, and and the program was was operating well financially, um, but I didn't think at that point in time it was creating the kind of cultural program that we needed at the university. We weren't creating a sense of community. We had a lot of students come in, they get their food, it was all a la carte, they kick it back to their room, and for some campuses that works really well. Here we were not developing a sense of community, and what we ended up having was students who would, would you know, basically kind of check in and check out. Mm -hmm. And so as we started down the path of, first of all, having your company come in and do a campus dining plan, I think that was a relatively important piece to open some eyes on what an all-you-care-to-eat dining program could do on the campus, but on top of it, sharing a little bit about the successes that have happened at some of the other campuses and helping administrators here see that making a significant change to an all-you-care-to-eat format was, was a pretty important piece in helping them develop a campus dining program that students would resonate with, that students would identify and, and find as a social gathering kind of place, mm -hmm. and we begin to build some of that social structure over time. But uh, I think that initial conversation, that initial visit, we found out that students overwhelmingly really wanted an All You Care to Eat program, but yet we were offering an a la carte program. So somewhere along the line there was a mis there was a disconnect between what students said they wanted and what they were actually getting. So in that process we took the criteria that we got from the survey, we actually started down the line and, and went through the different checkpoints. It took a lot longer to, to implement it completely here than I originally thought. We, I thought a year or two and we'll be up and running and everything will be all turned over. It took us a total of three years to get it totally converted to an all-you-care-to-eat dining program. Talk a little bit about, you'd mentioned before when it was a la carte, it didn't have a sense of community. Uh, it wasn't that social. People would get food uh, and then maybe kind of grab and go. But with the all-you-care-to-eat or the anytime dining, the ability to come and go as frequently as they, ch they, they choose. Of course, there's, the, there's, there's that part of it, the unlimited access. There's the extended hours, in some cases till midnight, uh, or a, a little bit later than normally uh, with a la carte. And uh, then there were the operating days too. I mean, what, were there challenges in wanting to extend the hours of operation with this type of a program on your campus in some of these locations? Well, for sure. And that was, again, part of the process of getting people to adjust to the change and the differences. Uh -huh. um, of course, you're going to expand hours. Well, it's going to cost us more staffing time. When right. you're going to extend and have continuous dining, the staff members looked at it as well. We haven't done that before, and if we do that, we'll have to. There's different expectations for people, so we had to manage some of those expectations with staff and and also with our administrators of saying that if we extend hours, we're going to extend service. If we extend these services and we're already providing some limited service during those hours, we're going to just capture more customer satisfaction. So how did your students react to that when you extend, like, uh, when you extended your hours till midnight in some of the locations? How did your students react to those extended hours? Well, at first we extended two dining centers to 11 o'clock. Okay. And so, and students really resonated with that very, very well. Um, we went from having, you know, very small participation at first 
to a very robust participation as the year went on. And of course, in Northern Illinois, it gets cold in the winter, so people are looking for somewhere to hang out and inside for sure. Yeah. So, you know, we saw the numbers really grow during the winter. Um, then we, about a year ago, we switched to only having one dining center open late. Um, but it's open till midnight, and it's the one that has most of our, it has the widest variety of platforms. And then it allowed us to move the other dining centers from being open and from seven to open until eight at night. Okay. So we have all of our other dining centers open till eight, and then one that's open till midnight, Sunday through Thursday. And then on the weekends, on Friday and Saturday, we close at eight. Let me ask you this, you had mentioned that there was a, eventually a very robust participation from students. Was there also uh, a big jump in your food costs with more students coming more frequently later into the evening? No, there really wasn't. What mm -hmm. we found is that people came, they ate, um, I would venture to say our numbers just did not show it. When we looked at our plate cost numbers, we looked at our food cost numbers, we looked at that information, it just did not show that the overall level of consumption increased, we just saw more people showing up and eating, and some of that was social. We right. would see people sitting at tables and maybe a couple people be eating, and a couple people would be visiting. So they may have come in later just to meet with friends, or what we also attribute some of that to is the fact that students came more often and didn't eat as much per trip, and I think that also resonates, resonates with some good nutritional habits and some good things that you hear recommended on a regular basis that people should eat more meals and less at each meal. And so I think some of that takes place as well. What you'll hear from parents is an unlimited access plan. My kid is going to weigh 300 pounds more than they went to school. You know, it's good. they're going to eat every day all the time. The novelty wears off. And one of the interesting things, I had a colleague at another campus who, who changed to this format uh, last year, and one of the things that director called me, it was like mid-October, my food cost is totally going out the window. I've used like 40% of my food cost already for the year, and it's only like mid to late October. Right. I said, don't sweat it, don't sweat it. By probably late October, mm, first couple weeks of, of November, you're going to have probably, you'll get really close to 50% of your yearly food cost by that time. Right. I said, do not worry about it because it's that mentality that I can eat, 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 eat. And what happens is as soon as they go home for Thanksgiving and then they come back, it all settles down. Mm -hmm. And then in the second semester, it settled down really well as also. So what we found is that normally you, you, you can use up to 50% of your food costs for the entire year by the first part of November. And people panic because they think then they're going to their food cost is going to be two and a half times or two and a quarter times their actual consumption, and it just doesn't didn't appear. And in that colleague's case, they didn't appear either. Right. And they called back later and said, "Wow, that, it really did work." You know. Right. So, so I think the idea is watch your plate costs carefully, make sure and monitor those plate costs, look at your plate cost in comparison to participation numbers, so that you know what those participation numbers look like and then watch your participation numbers again, comparing them to play costs throughout the semester and then into the spring semester. Now, you've had this in place now for quite a few years. Have you noticed uh, any change with how the students participate or use it, particularly students that either don't live on campus or students that live on campus where meal plan participation isn't mandatory? Yeah, that's interesting, David. We um, about three years ago, we went to our administration and asked them if we could implement a full-fledged commuter meal plan or off-campus meal plan program. And I did some research in our NACUFS directory to talk about and show what the schools that had, what their residency was, what the number of meal plans they sold, and said, you know, here's kind of a silver bullet here. We've got We've got more students living on cam off campus than we do living on campus, and we're selling 50 plans a semester or something. It's a, I mean, even if we get another 100, that's 100 we didn't have before. Sure. So I did some math and just said, you know, here's here's some ways that we can potentially improve. And we I use the word potentially because we don't want to promise anything, right. but you know that we could do. And other schools that had pretty good success with this. 
So we put it into play. The first year we got 400 and some commuter meal plans or off-campus meal plans. The second year it was 600 and some commuter meal plans, and last year it was just under a thousand. So, God. so and these what that are eating in the all, all you care to eat or the anytime dining venue? Now, all of our plans have anytime dining meals in them. Yep. But of that, I was pulling some numbers together this morning, and of our thousand or nine hundred and thirty-five hundred, nine hundred forty commuter meal plans we sold last fall. Okay, 277 of those plans were unlimited access plans. They're just going to eat all their meals with it. Completely so voluntary, eat. almost 300 unlimited access plans. Correct. The students yeah. living off campus and it's not mandatory. Right. That's phenomenal. The nice, the nice thing here is this brought another $1.45 million to the table for us wow. this last year. Okay, that's brand new money that we didn't have before and there isn't an administrator out there that doesn't like new money. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, so we brought that and overall our labor footprint did not exceed or grow of any significance. A little bit in student labor here and there but not much. Um, our regular staff footprint didn't grow at all. In fact, it's actually decreased and um, our administrative labor did not go up, and the only thing that we really absorbed was our cost of goods. So whenever that cost of goods grew as a percentage or as your plate cost grew, that's the only thing you really absorb. So if you, you're really absorbing at the maximum, you're absorbing 30 to 32 percent food cost across the board. Right. Well, let me let me transition a little bit, step out of dining for a second and get a perspective from some other departments. For example, uh, how does housing view what you've done with your dining program? Do they see that as uh, a plus in terms of it being an amenity, kind of an asset to students that are living on campus, or a negative or a neutral, kind of before and after? What's their take on it? I think they're seeing it as a positive. I think they feel significantly better about the sense of community in our residential settings. One of the things I pulled together with this morning was the, some pieces on retention. Um, our retention over the last, um, starting let's say in the fall of 2013, which would have been a reflection of the previous year's first year where some of our dining centers had gone to unlimited access or all you care to eat, yep. um, it was 30.96. Uh, in a retention basis. And keep in mind, our retention numbers are going to be slanted because we have a unique mixture of room and board ratio on our income here. Okay. So the, the percentage of students who return to the residence halls the second and or third or fourth year. So in fall of 2013, numbers were 30.96. Okay. In the fall of 2014, it's 32.37. Okay. In the fall of 15, it was 33.23. And we're projecting this fall a range between 37 and 44 percent. Wow! So well, that's a big jump. I mean, towards the end, yeah. it really kind of a yeah. slow, kind of slow, slow, and then boom! It really jumped in the last year or so. Right. And one of the things that's helpful for us is, as many other state schools have seen, unless you're the the um, you know the University of or the State University of, you know the state schools themselves are, are really struggling right now with enrollment numbers. So it, it's really helped move the needle with student retention. It's moved the needle significantly with student participation in your dining program, especially with voluntary meal plans with it, north of a million dollars a year in new growth. Uh, it seems to be a big plus for housing. And uh, in terms of just kind of the financial metrics, uh, has it contributed significantly more to your bottom line or what you can return to the school? Overall, we've had really good success with it here. At other campuses where I've done it, we've had huge success. Right. Okay, um, The commuter plans here are starting to take off and move forward. And one of the things we're finding is the increase each year. And I think what we're finding is that reflection is that students move off campus. Okay but their dining needs don't significantly change. Right. And 
it is a reflection on the kind of program that our staff and our and our administrators and our guiding centers are running. They're running a good program or students wouldn't be volunteering and putting their money on the table to buy those plans. Mm -hmm. They just absolutely wouldn't. Great. Um, so I think those are really positive pieces that are changing in the overall scheme of things. Each of our commuter plans that are not unlimited access have a, a certain number of all-you-care-to-eat meals built in. Okay. And then they have flex dollars that they can use. Interestingly enough, the highest use of flex dollars on those plans is in our residential dining centers when they burn up the meals. Really? Yeah. So that was very interesting. But I think there's also a reflection in we want to continue to improve their perceived value because we want to build in that piece that when students leave the residential setting, they've had experience in a retail setting on campus because that will be the hook that brings them back to buy a commuter meal plan. And along with the residential experience, they also experience the cafes and other places on campus so they can utilize their resources. That plan gives them the portability to use it across the board. And what we want to do is we want to keep them in our residential dining centers, but we also want to make sure we're adding convenience to their meal plan choice so they'll continue to buy that plan because of the convenience. Right. And so what, the way we offer our plans, the way we do it is this new bus ad that's going on our buses this fall. We have one, and it's um, it has three pictures of, of a sink full of dirty dishes. <laughs> and it says, um, Concentrate on studies, not dishes. Let us cook for you. That's okay. Great. And so what it is is basically a supplementary plan. We want to supplement their meal needs. And yes, we like it if they want to buy the entire, you know, unlimited access plan. But we know that many students are on a budget, and what we figure is that if we can supplement some of those meals and some of those, you know, menu options with them throughout the week, we keep them engaged. Eventually, we're hoping that the fun and frill of cooking at home and all that sort of stuff wears off and they buy a larger plan the next semester because they're tired of doing the biology projects in the refrigerators. Right. So we hope that that will wear off. Um, our fall to spring meal plan participation for commuters exactly correlates that with enrollment. It's very interesting. So it drops a slight amount in the spring, but it drops almost exactly the same level as our as our enrollment. Hmm. So it's very interesting. And it doesn't drop a ton. Right. And it drops less than our actual reduction in our housing. So we, we retain more off-campus meal plans in the spring than we retain students in the spring living in the housing. Well, Richard, we're kind of coming up on our time here. I want to, again, congratulate you on all your success. What would you say uh, to directors out there, administrators, who, you know, we talked earlier and you mentioned kind of that skepticism factor about making a transition to any time dining from a la carte or even from all you care to eat. I mean, uh, what kind of advice would you give those folks in terms of getting past some of those mental obstacles or practical obstacles? Give a call to someone who's currently doing it mm -hmm. and get the scoop from them directly. Right. Okay, you know, and it's great. Your book is a remarkable resource and etc. But nothing beats calling the director or the or the manager who's running one of those programs and getting the scoop directly from them. Tell me truthfully what's your plate cost? Okay, tell me truthfully what did your plate cost change for when you went to this to this? Tell me what you're truthfully what your administrators are saying about your program. You'll find that 99.999% of those directors are going to tell you the straight stuff, and it's going to be good stuff. Right. Okay, it's going to resonate with, with the kind of elements that you've talked about, and others around the the campus dining community have talked about as well. And that is this unlimited access, anytime dining, is the key to building sense of community with your students. Mm -hmm. One of the things to look at is that as you see our millennial students, they want to feel a part. They want to be a part, and if they're not made to feel a part of something relatively quick in their campus experience, your chances of retaining them as a student diminishes significantly. 
And one of the pieces that you can do is your campus dining program and your residential community program, those have to be tied together very tightly. And that's our that initial gate of getting them in the door, helping them feel connected, and helping them be a part of a, something special. They can feel then part of the campus. That will help resonate with retention and recruitment. Well, thank you, Richard. This has been great. And I thank everybody for joining us today. If you would like to talk to Richard directly, uh, as he just suggested, talking to somebody who's been through it, you can call, uh, you can contact me or my colleague Josh Lazarus at Porter Call Consulting. We're at 410-451-3617. Uh, we will put you in touch with Richard. Uh, and also, if you'd like other names or individuals that have gone through this, uh, we've got a couple of dozen, we can send you contact information for them as well. So again, thank you everybody, and uh, Richard, thank you very much. It's been a great, it's been a great talk today. Thank you. Thank you.